Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. So we're going to back up three chapters as far as uh, Paul's uh, status. Okay, so Paul is in, um, he's in Caesarea, and this is where the three um, Three other epistles are written. You, know, you have Galatians, Ephesians, uh, Philippians, and Colossians. Ephesians is written, is, uh, and, and these are all written about, uh, I'm sorry, I will, we'll, we'll wait. Or can, we go ahead, can we go ahead and start doing some uh, verbose? Yeah, if we can get to the, uh, the map or that, the, the chart or the map. And I guess we didn't get that, and that needs to be updated because we got it off of Dropbox because I just updated some stuff on it. Hallelujah. We need Paul's third and fourth missionary journeys. All right. As you remember, Paul had been uh, to Jerusalem. And there was a stir call. Uh, Bill, are you recording yet? All right. Paul's, Paul had been in Jerusalem, and, and they, they uh, went to the temple and, and tried to accuse him of causing trouble. And so then um, uh, they arrested him. And then because uh, Paul was, you know, they were, they were going to try to make Paul answer and some stuff, and he, he, uh, they, they, they got him out of town overnight because people were lying away to kill him. And then he ended up in Caesarea. And then um, when, um, you know, one of the uh, guys in there, I forget, Felix or Festus, um, eventually was trying to, you know, get Paul, and they were going to try to try him and so forth. And he said he was a Roman, and, and so he, he appealed to Caesar at this point. And so it says he stays, uh, Felix leaves him bound when he leaves his position and uh, takes off and leaves Paul bound. And so Paul stays bound for three, uh, for two years here in uh, around between 60 and 62 AD. Paul is left there, and, and then... Uh, after his appeal, he obviously is, is taken to Rome. But during this two years, he's in prison. And, um, and so he writes three letters to the church during this time period. And um, it is the letter to the letter church Ephesians, the letter to the church at Philippi, and then the letter to the church at Colossae. And so uh, we're going to read this, uh, start studying here, and go to Ephesians chapter 1. We're moving to Ephesians chapter 1. And here, probably one of the most poignant uh, doctrinal letters to the church at large that Paul writes. Uh, some believe that the, the, the Ephesians and uh, could have been a very, very well been a circular letter um, written to the region. But Ephesians is is one of the most clearly defined and, uh, and letters as far as dealing with doctrine in the first half and um, implementation or action or duty in regards to the doctrine in the second half. So Ephesians 1, 2, 3 are doctrinal in um, essence and in writing. Um, according to the, and I can't pronounce, this is a German word, uh, verbis, versby, expository. Now this is what they say about Ephesians. Ephesians balances doctrine and duty. First, Paul reminds us of what God has done for us. Then he tells us what we must do for him in response to his mercies. Christian living is based on Christian learning. The believer who does not know his wealth in Christ will never, Lord, thank you for just skipping all over the place on me here. It just jumped all over, like way back to, to the PowerPoint, middle of it. Come on. Okay. The believer who does not know his wealth in Christ will never be able to walk for Christ. Our conduct depends on our calling. Too many Christians live in chapters 1 through 3 and study the doctrines, but fail to move into chapters 4 through 6 and practice the duties. Now that is... 
uh, where we are today in the church, is, and by and large in a lot of areas, we're really into the doctrine, but we're not, we don't care about doing the duty of, of the gospel. So um, we're going to begin here in Ephesians chapter 1. And here uh, the Apostle Paul, he's, he writes and, and so forth. But he writes to the church and he begins his whatever. And I'm trying to get out of this particular section so that I can get into something else. And I'm just having all kinds of fun with my, my uh, tablet tonight. And this is when you think, why in the world did I ever move over to a tablet? You know, you kind of think, why didn't I just stay with an old-fashioned um, doohickey? Y'all know what I mean? <laughs> Glory. So let me see here. An old-fashioned And I'm getting ready to throw this through the wall. And thank you, everybody, for giving the money to buy this. And then go start printing stuff again. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for victory over doohickeys. Here we go. All right. Okay. Now, we understand. I'm sorry. It took me all that time to find it. It, it, would, it wouldn't show up, so I had to, I had to get to it. Um, Ephesus was one of the great cities of Asia Minor. It was a Roman capital. It was one of the capitals of Rome, and it was a very cultural center. It's where a lot of trade went through, but their goddess was the goddess Diana, and, and that was, uh, uh, you know, remember Paul, was, they had the big uh, crowd come out there day and greatest, greatest Diana uh, of the Ephesians and so forth. And the trades were mad because Paul was getting people saved. Um, Paul visited this city, uh, and that's where he met Priscilla and Aquila. And he returned there on his third journey. He remained there for three years, ministering in, in and out. And remember, he wrote letters to, over to Corinth and so forth, as we already read. Um, he, he really had a lot of effect on that city. Kind of caused a lot of uproar. People were upset. And then um, he wrote this letter to the church at Ephesus and in all likelihood the surrounding areas. While he was in prison, uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 62, 63 A.D., while he was in Caesarea in prison. And that is what we refer to as Paul's first imprisonment. Okay, so Paul wrote this letter to there uh, from that place. The, um, the church at Ephesus was... Um, uh, Paul deals with them collectively as a whole and, and, and in reference to the church, um, somewhat in the sense of the universal doctrine of the church instead of some of his individual teachings. And, um, and then he begins to write in his letter, and so he gets into the letter, and he goes, Paul, an apostle, Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints, which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, these are uh, fairly standard opening salutations from Paul, yet at the same time we understand that he didn't write this without purpose. It wasn't just, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah to put in there and make it have a filler. Um, he establishes that he's an apostle of Jesus Christ, and it was by the will of God. He's writing to the church, okay, the saints, and the faithful in Christ Jesus. Then he goes on and says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father. And from the Lord Jesus Christ, he wants them to understand that they're, they're living in a place of grace uh, by faith in, in Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. I, I like this because Paul establishes that we're blessed. You know, some people say, well, you know, uh, I don't believe in that, that blessing business. Well, Paul did. Amen. Uh, Jesus had a whole thing called, the, we, we call it the Beatitudes, blessed be, all right? Paul says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? He hath blessed us. With what? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Let me say this. All blessings from God start spiritually. They start spiritually. So we want to understand that, he, that it is a spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. According as he hath chosen us in him, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy 
and without blame before him in love. And this is going to be the next one. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the will, I mean, according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, we, we could get in here and spend a month of arguing with people about predestination. You know, see, there's some people that are predestined. Well, if you, if you took that, that meant everybody in Ephesus was just, it's, it's the only bunch that was predestined. You know, everybody else outside there wasn't. Uh, we have to go back and read things. Now, Paul wrote to the church at Rome before he wrote to the church at um, Ephesus. And in Romans chapter 8, he said, for whom he, for, he did foreknow, he did predestine to be conformed to the image of his son. So we understand that foreknowledge plays in God's predestination. That the election of mankind is based on the foreknowledge of God. When he foreknew you, he elected you. What? To be conformed to the image of his son. Here, we, we, we're, we're uh, predestinated to, unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. No longer uh, uh, servants, no longer under the tutelage. We're called to be children of God in Jesus Christ. Listen to this. But to himself, that is to him, God the Father, according to the good pleasure of his will. God designed and God desired that we be called and brought into a place that we are conformed or we, to the image of his son, that we are the adopted of God, you, you know, and we were, we're brought into where we're not just living off of servant blessings, we're living off of a household children blessing. And remember, you know, he that's mature, he that's led by the Spirit of God is a child of God. Amen. Can I, I, I have to interrupt. Can we get the air conditioner? Somebody hit that air conditioner and turn it down too cold. Um, they keep that up. I'm going to think it's last Wednesday night outside. You know, we're sitting here today, it's seven, nearly 70 degrees last week. Uh, a winter storm came in on Wednesday night. We had seven inches of snow. Just, don't you just love North Carolina? Yeah, what, what was it set on? Ah, uh, I wonder who did that. I'm going to go get my son. He loves it cold. Hey, having predestined us, predestinated us unto the adoption of children, we are now living under the, let's think about this, the difference between natural birth and adopted you know, is that they, you're, you've been chosen by the adoptor. And so God, when he, he knew that you would have received Jesus, adopted us as children. You know, we, we received the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to the Father according to the good pleasure of his will. Now, we, we kind of have to put that in relationship to um, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. According, he's chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And um, having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. Here we are. All the blessings of God are coming on us because we're adopted of God. Hallelujah. We get all those blessings. Just we get all those blessings. Amen? Hallelujah. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. He has made us accepted in the beloved. Can you say glory? Hallelujah. He, he, you know, so we are now not just, you know, we don't have to come and find acceptance. We've been made accepted in the beloved. Glory to God. <clears throat> and it is in the beloved in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Our redemption is through the blood of Jesus. I know there are denominations that are taking the blood out. They don't want to sing about the blood, don't want to talk about the blood. They're not going to have anything to do with the blood. It makes Christianity a bloody or, or heathenistic religion. But it is that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. It is the crux. It is the central core of the gospel. Without the shedding of blood, there is no redemption. If Jesus didn't, you know, Re Revelation says that we overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Our confession of Christ without the blood is meaningless. So it, may, it requires the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of of his grace. It is his grace that made the provision for the blood to be made available for us to receive by faith 
the forgiving power of the blood. It is God's grace that went into operation and made this provision. Yet on the other side, it, you know, by, by grace are you saved through faith, and, you know, that not of yourselves is the gift of God. So you have to have the operation of faith uh, in order to receive from God. Now notice itself, verse 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth, even in him. So it's coming a day, there's coming the time, there's coming the hour when all things will be gathered together, that the church, uh, sleeping and, and alive uh, on, the, on the earth, in their bodies, will be gathered together in the fullness of time. Now, you can't bring Jesus back before his time, before the fullness of time. You just can't do it. You can fast and pray and have call everybody on the planet and go get up on top of a mountain and do whatever it is you think you've got to do to try to get him back because i got great faith. Faith is based on what the Word says, and God says that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together all, in, in, in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and on the earth, even in him. That's, that's a time coming that you can't make happen faster than it's going to happen. Glory to God. It's going to be according to the plan of God when he determines this fullness of time. In whom we also, we, uh, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being, predest being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. We have obtained an inheritance. Now, God, remember, we, we cannot read anything we're reading about predestination without going back to Romans 8. As a matter of fact, we might well just want to flip over there real quick to Romans chapter 8. And um, back up in here. Verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn, many brethren. Moreover, whom, moreover, whom he predestinated, or did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. So notice that God, pre through foreknowledge, everything in respect to foreknowledge, I mean, to, to predestination is based on foreknowledge. Romans after, chapter 8, verse 29, for whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. And if he conformed them, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, he did predestinate them, predestinate them that he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, he also glorified. So Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 20, 30, make it very clear that predestination is based on the foreknowledge of those who would accept, not on the fact that God was going to elect certain ones and not elect other ones uh, out, of a, out of his will, that some are just going to go to hell and some will go to heaven. That's just the way it's going to be, and there's nothing you can do about it. God made his predestination based on the foreknowledge of who would accept the plan that he offered. Remember, the Word says he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of, of the truth. So that cannot mean, if he's not willing that any should perish, that he's going to make a certain group perish and a certain group get saved if his will is that none perish. See, when you remove man's will from the equation, you end up with crazy stuff. Lunacy. People preaching all kinds of stuff because they leave all the scriptures out that, you know, that, that combat or, or, or balance the extreme election teaching, you know, that, you know, uh, uh, you know, you got Cal extreme Calvinism, you know, people, you have God's irresistible grace. You just can't help it. You're going to get saved whether you like it or not. It's against your will. Even if it's against your will, if God chooses to save you, you're going to get saved because you can't resist his grace. And I have to say this. If God's grace is absolutely irresistible and you cannot resist it out of your will, <clears throat> uh, then everybody would be saved. Except they come back and say, he just decided some weren't going to get saved. Now, if he's not willing that any should perish, why would he say he not save some folk? You got to reconcile all of it. You just can't reconcile one or two your little your little side of it and leave all the other scriptures out. Before, but I'll be honest with you, the the Romans eight 
uh, 29 answers a lot of issues for a lot of people along the lines of, um, you know, the election, predestination, and it's all based on this, foreknowledge. The foreknowledge puts that into operation. God knew that Karen would accept Jesus Christ at some point in time in her life. And because of that, he did predestinate her unto the adoption of children uh, through Jesus Christ unto himself. He did predestinate her to be called. He, she became elect before God because he knew she would receive that. And so all the scriptures that do with the election come from the foreknowledge of God. Once, now, now think about this now. It was not, if you study your Old Testament a little bit, you'll find out it wasn't God's will for Israel to have a king. Go study it. Samuel came to him, and, and he says, you've not, you know, he's whining, he's whining, that may not be true. He's whining to the Lord, and God says, don't, don't, bother, don't bother about it. They haven't rejected you. They've rejected me. Now, once he gave them a king, it was his will. He chose the king, or, you know, he told them who, who you know, they put the line in. God's will became they have a king. It was changed because of their action. It was never his intent for them to have a king. But after that, he anointed Saul to be king. David was anointed and, and called of God to be king. God got involved in that because that's what they demanded. He gave it to them. So in that case, it became his will. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to the knowledge of the truth. Remember, we read this to you. Out of the book of Revelation, it says, talking about the, the, the elect or, or, or the redeemed and the saved, that, that when they open up the books, whosoever's name was not blotted out. You know, God, you know, names got blotted out. Why? Because he wasn't willing, any, willing that any should perish, and he put everybody's name in there to start with. The Lamb's book of life contained everybody's name, but those who rejected him got blotted out. Why? Because it was God's will that everybody be saved. It was God's will that everybody be saved. And because it was his will that everybody be saved, he knew which ones would and which ones wouldn't. And the ones that don't get blotted. You're a big ink spot in the book of life. Nobody wants to be the ink spot in the book of life. All right? Hallelujah. But those he knows except Jesus Christ are predestinated to things, to the adoption of children, to be, uh, become, uh, to be conformed to the image of his sons. We read over there in Romans. They're called. They're elect. All that now comes into play based on the foreknowledge. And I had no, no, no problem with that. You know, I'm chosen of God and elect because I chose to receive Jesus. He did not make me choose. The whole purpose of God's creation was so that God could have a, a family of spirit beings in his class that would worship him because they wanted to and fellowship with him because they wanted to and to be with him because they wanted to, not because they had to. Amen. And because man fell, God so was, so, was, was uh, so determined to make man have an opportunity, Jesus came and redeemed mankind. And somebody say hallelujah. If God... I mean, if you think about some of the crazy stuff people come up with, and they just run off of God's sovereign and do whatever he wants to. But if God created man so he could fall, so he could send people to hell, there's something wrong with that. That was never his intention. His intention was that man, that man would live and serve him all, all the lives. And, and I say serve, be in fellowship. God wanted man in the fellowship. He, didn't, he, he never wanted servants. He wanted fellowship. He made man the under ruler over earth. Gave him dominion over it. Told him to subdue it, replenish it. Had dominion over all these different things, every, creepy thing, every uh, living thing and everything that creepeth upon the face of the earth. I like what Buddy Harrison always said. He said, thank God we got authority over creeps. Amen. That goes on this life too, doesn't it? Hallelujah. And so verse 11, whom we have obtained an inheritance, being pressed, predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now notice this terminology is in reference to predestinating us and having received an inheritance. 
See, people go take that last part out and just run off with it, and then all of a sudden everything happens according to the will of God. You know, your wife got killed by a car running over her, and, the, and you're sitting in your living room, and somebody rides by and shoots a bullet at the neighbor's house that ricochets and hits your wife and kills her, and God had a reason. <laughs> God doesn't do that. But they'll just take a look. They'll take part of a verse. You can't take part of a verse, especially on something and build a whole doctrine on it. In whom we have also obtained an inheritance. Thank God we have an inheritance with the children of light. Can you say amen? Our inheritance is the inheritance of the redeemed, praise God. Our inheritance is the inheritance of, being, of, of Abraham. Remember, that we're blessed with faithful Abraham. If you be Christ, then you Abraham, see, and heirs. What, what, what heirs get? The inheritance. Isn't that right? Look at Romans chapter 4. I'm sorry. Yeah, look at Romans chapter 4. Verse 13, for the promise that he, and you look back up, it's referring to Abraham, should be the heir of the world. Now, heir, if you're an heir, you get an inheritance. If you're not an heir, you don't get the inheritance. Isn't that right? Was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if they which are of the law be heirs, and faith is made void, and the promise made of none effect, because the law worketh wrath, where there is no where, where, the, the, where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end that the promise might be sure to all the seed, and not, and not to that only which is of the law, but also to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made thee the father of many nations before God, whom he believed, uh, I'm sorry, uh, before him whom he believed, even God, who makes the dead alive and calls those things which be not as though they were, who against hope or under utterly hopeless circumstances but hopefully believe that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. Look over at Galatians real quick. Chapter 3. Verse oh, 13, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles, how? Through Christ, Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through how? Faith. Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. Though it be but a man's covenant, yet if it be confirmed, no man disannulleth or addeth thereto. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not unto seeds as of many, but to seed, but to as of one. And that was something I wanted to read back over here in Romans. I didn't get to it. I, I left it out. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Oh, well, God said, I'm blessing, I'll bless you, and multiplying, I'll multiply you. I'm not seeing, I'm not seeing it real quick. You know, you change Bibles, and you don't have them all underlined anymore. You've got to go back and redo it all again. Hallelujah. Where is it, Bill? Blessing, I'll bless you, multiplying, I'll multiply you. Well, y'all find it. That, that's the promise. Okay. That is the promise of God to the church, to, to actually to Abraham. Surely I will bless you and bless you. Well, in blessing, I'll bless thee, and in multiplying, I'll multiply thee. That's King James. Um, Wayman says, I will bless you and bless you and increase you and increase you. So the blessing of Abraham is the blessing of prosperity, of increase, of, of, of just blessing in every hand, and on, on the left hand and on the right hand. Glory to God. And so we get in Galatians, and we find that in verse 16, that to Abraham and to his seed was the promise made. Now, he said not to seeds as of many, and to thy seed, which is Christ. So Abraham had a promise made to him of blessing and multiplication, blessing and blessing and multiplying and multiplying, 
to Abraham and to his seed. And Galatians makes it clear that the seed is Christ. Not many seeds, not all the different lineage, but to Christ. Praise God. Now, this is why it's so important we understand what it means to be in Christ because the blessing is made to Abraham and his seed, Christ. Amen? And so if we look on over here um, later in this chapter, we get down to verse 27. For as many of you has been baptized in the Christ, you put on Christ. You be, there, be neither, there, there be neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Christ Jesus. And if ye be Christ, possessive, so Christ is possessive, then are ye Abraham's seed, not seeds, as of many back over the earlier part of this chapter. And what? And what? And what? Heirs according to the promise. Now, what was it? What's the promise again? I'll bless you, bless you, and increase you, and increase you. You know, you'll be my people. God made a covenant promise with Abraham. Amen? And now we are the covenant people of God. And we have a promise. And because we are Abraham's seed, everybody say seed, then are we heirs according to the promise. The promise. Now let's, now let's go back up here. Verse 11. And whom we've obtained an inheritance, we are heirs of the promise of Abraham. I said we are heirs of the promise made to Abraham. Glory to God. I said glory to God. What? You live by faith. You receive the promises of God by faith. You walk in the blessing. And being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Now again, the counsel of his own will has already been wrought. And that the blessing was to Abraham and to his seed. That was already established. And who becomes the seed? Those that are in Christ. How do you get in Christ? You get born again. How do you get born again? You believe the message preached. God does not make you believe. He says, whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say whoever God makes call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. See, people get off on this... Uh, well, I mean, they get on this, uh, this predestination stuff to the point, they'll say, you know, oh, God makes people prostitutes so, you know, he can show his mercy. And, and, and some of these people, uh, you know, makes them, you know, this and that so he can, he can send them to hell. And all kinds, you know. He, now, why is God going to make people into what he said they can't be? People get stupid with this stuff. But they get, they get on their little thing, and, you know, they go, you know, the tulip, you know. Uh, and again, into the, the tulip the teaching of election. You know, one of them is the irre irresistible grace in there. You know. Yeah, it's, 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 it is extreme Calvinism. Uh, you know, and you know, the election. P, P is the predestination part. I forgot what all the other ones are. You know, and I is the irresistible grace. I forgot what the T, U, and L are. I just don't remember. Because I don't, I don't practice it. Why? Because I made a choice. I chose to accept, amen, I chose to accept that the truth was in the gospel. And I believed what was in the gospel. Notice when King Agrippa said, almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian, Paul said, I, I not only wish you almost, but all together. He did not go, well, that's just tough. God won't let you get saved anyway because you weren't predestined to get saved. The only reason you can't go all the way from almost all the way is because you weren't predestined to be that. But Paul didn't say that. He said, I wish you were you all way, not just almost, but all, all persuaded, completely persuaded. Why? Because the message of the gospel is who will ever, whosoever will, let him come. Look back at the great commission of the church. I don't think I'm gonna, I may not finish the first chapter. But we, I tell you what we'll do, we'll get down to verse 17, where the prayer for the church, and we'll stop there in a minute. But let me, let's go back over here. Um, 
to the great commission of the church. That's a good place to go, isn't it? See, when we go to the world, don't you like our little world map up there thing? Yeah, that's really cool looking. I think it looks really cool. Look at Mark's gospel, starting uh, chapter 16, starting in verse 14. Afterward, he appeared unto the eleven as they sat at meat. They were eating dinner. How many like to eat dinner? I like eating dinner. I like eating lunch. I like eating breakfast. Now, down in Eastern Carolina, we never called it dinner. We always called it supper. And so a lot of times, dinner was lunch. For a lot of people, dinner was lunch and supper was the nighttime meal. And people say, well, you got it backwards down there. Don't forget, the first people who showed up and colonized here was in North Carolina. Brother Hagin used to say, well, you know, we got a good old colloquial, uh, Texas, uh, colloquial Texas expression. And, uh, and he'd say something, I'm going, everybody in Texas must be from North Carolina. Because I've been saying that my whole life. <laughs> and he's not here to defend himself anymore. He's probably looking at the banners and going, uh, Texas is still right. But, you know, uh, sad at me, he upbraided them with their unbelief and hardness of heart because they believed not them which is, uh, had seen him after he was risen. See, when you kind of start taking a lecture and trying to put it into the whole Bible, you find that it just doesn't make sense. It wouldn't matter if they had hardness of heart and didn't believe him because if they were chosen to believe or not to believe, there was nothing they could do about it. It would be wrong for him to get on their case for not believing when they, God fixed them so they couldn't believe. But listen to what he says, go into the world and go into all the world. And another thing, you would need to preach the gospel. Yeah. If they're going to get saved no matter what, there's no need to preach the gospel. He'll just make, he'll just make rocks talk to them and say, Jesus says for you to get saved, and you're, you're, elect, you're going to get saved no matter what, so you're saved. And somebody could be seeking after God come in and go, no, nope, God said you're not getting saved, you're going to hell. Tough, pal. But just go ahead and punch your ticket, and, you know, and you may as well go party hardy and live it up because you're going to burn for eternity. Now, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth. He that believeth. See, this is the act of faith that man's, man is designed to respond to God with. Faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As a matter of fact, let me read this. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now, look, did you see anything in this passage that said God determined who believed and God determined who wouldn't believe? He said, preach the gospel, the choice is up to them. And if they believe, they're saved. If they don't believe, they're damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they shall cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. And that is not linguistics. I'm just, just, that's just stupid. They shall take up service. That's not snake handling services. So you got the people who don't believe in the, in, in, in the baptism of the Holy Ghost say that t the tongues here is linguistics. Then you got the crazy Pentecostals, and I grew up Pentecostal, um, that go have snake handling services. God didn't say go handle snakes. If they drink any deadly thing, don't go drink no arsenic to prove that you're, you're going to be healed. You know, It shall not hurt. Then they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Talking about if you get bitten by a snake like Paul did on the Isle of Milita, My, Milita's. You know, the snake came out and bit him. He, he did shook it off and didn't die. Okay. You drink something poisonous by accident, you, you know, or somebody tries to poison you, they could drink any of the other thing and won't hurt. It doesn't mean that you do it on purpose. How do you know? Because thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God, Jesus said, when, when Satan tried to get him to throw himself off the temple. You see, if people read the whole Bible, they, get out, they stay out of trouble. So they come along, okay, we, we could just go ahead and, and drink up some poison and then prove that we've got faith. Then why didn't Jesus jump off the pinnacle of the temple? Because the scripture said he'll give his angels to bear thee up, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. And Jesus said, it's also written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. To do something to prove like that, that you got, I got faith, I can drink a bottle of poison and not, and not die, we'll be doing your funeral. Now, if somebody poisons you or something was poisonous that you drank and didn't know it, it shall not harm you. Glory to God. You may have drank stuff that was poisonous and didn't know it, but you just didn't even bother. You went right on. Okay? So, um, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And I was going to go to another verse uh, in re reference to that. Uh, 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 da, ba, 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 ba. Romans 10. 
Thank you, Lord, for putting that right, right in the memory banks there. Romans chapter 10. Can I just give me a few more minutes? Let me get through this. Um, Brother, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record, they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge, but they being ignorant of God's righteousness, go about to establish their own and have not... Now, why is Paul praying for them that they would get saved if God's already chosen who he is and who isn't? But for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, they're going about to establish their own and have not submitted themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. For Moses described the righteousness which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live in them. In other words, if you're trying to get, now listen, here is where people get off of some of this crazy stuff with grace. You know, they that, live, they that do the law shall live in them. He's talking about trying to obtain your salvation by doing the works of the law. He is not talking about doing works, meat of righteousness. For righteousness speaks on this wise, Say not in your heart who shall ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who shall descend into the deep, that is to bring up Christ again from the dead. But what does it say? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is the word of faith which we preach. Now some people come along, where well, Paul says that he preaches the gospel of grace, and they'll say, oh, Paul only preached the gospel of grace. He also called it the word of faith. Right here, he just called it the word of faith which we preach. Take the whole. Don't get so settled in and, and microscopically narrowed in on one aspect of something that that becomes the all because it's not the all. It's the whole counsel of the word of God. And there are aspects you can highlight in, in, at different times and different seasons, but the whole is the whole. See, so you, now you can get so busy trying to live by faith that you miss the grace side. And you can get so busy living under grace you miss the faith side. You can get so busy not doing works, you miss the works that are meet for righteousness. You take the whole. The whole will balance itself. The word of faith which we preach, that if we shall confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus, and shall believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Excuse me just a second. For with the heart, Man, what's the heart? Remember we talked about this when we are talking about spirit, soul, and body. The heart's the inner man, the spirit man. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. Not with your head, not with your body, but with your spirit man. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him in whom they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Now stop. Why is God sending preachers out so people can hear, so that people can believe, so that they can confess if they're going to get saved no matter what? How shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how lovely on. The mountains are the feet of them that preach good news, good news. Love that song. Anyway, hadn't sung it in years. Amen? How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. But they've not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed thy report? So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hallelujah. We have to preach because people have the right to believe. Amen. They have the choice to believe. And it's whosoever, whosoever believeth makes that confession. So, Verse 11, and whom we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. What was the predestination? That those who would believe and come into Christ would become heirs of the very same promise that Abraham had. 
not that they were going to get saved because they didn't want to. Well, God, God determined, determined that, you know, that, that one, let some girl's going to jump in the swimming pool and break her neck, and then she's going to draw with her mouth and, you know, and, and, and witness to everybody about her faith in Christ because she, you know, and just God broke her neck so she could do that. No, he didn't. No, he did not. And I'm glad she had a great testimony, and I'm glad she loved the Lord, and I'm glad she did great artwork, but God didn't break her neck so she could have, she could have had that testimony with two feet and two hands working. And I'm not condemning her, make, I'm trying to make it look bad. I'm saying when people come along and say, God did this, that is error. Yeah. God did not do that. God took that situation and, and worked with her where her faith was, and he will always work with you where your faith is. And if that's where your faith is, that is where he will work. Amen? But you can't blame him for causing it to happen in the first place. That's just, it's just erroneous. No, he didn't do it, wasn't his plan, wasn't his purpose, but he took what she allowed him to take and used it mightily, and we, gl we glorify God for what was wrought because of her heart to, ser keep, to serve the Lord. But God didn't do it. No, we're, 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 we're predestined to be, in, to be heirs, to walk in the blessing. Look at Psalm 91. I'm trying to finish up, but see, you guys weren't here for two weeks. I think one person showed up as we were finishing last week. We're not going to talk about it, they said. All right. And I can't figure out why. They, I, I, unless they were outside enjoying the weather, they stayed home tonight. Shame on you. Look at Psalm 91. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High will, shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, and Him will I trust. Surely He will deliver thee from the snare of the fowler and from the noisome pestilence. Pestilence is animal diseases. Anthrax gets covered. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings thou shalt trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid of the error, terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by, by day nor the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor the destruction that wasteth at noonday. Thousands shall fall at thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shalt thou behold the reward of the wicked, because he's made the Lord even the Most High his refuge, even the Most High thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, nor any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Now this is a promise to God's covenant people. God's plan is not to, to her, bring destruction, to bring misery, to bring devastation. God's plan is to bring blessing. As a matter of fact, it says, because you set your love on me. Hallelujah. Um, he'll give his angels charge over thee in all thy ways, to keep thee in all thy ways. They shall bear thee up in, the, in their hands, lest thou dash thy foot against his own. This is where Jesus was being quoted by the devil so he could kill himself, commit suicide, and Jesus didn't fall for it. No, but he'll bear you up in the midst of trouble. Not because you went out and jumped off a building like an idiot. Thou shalt tread upon the lion and the adder, the young lion and the dragon. Thou shalt trample under feet. Because he, now God responds, because he set his love upon me, therefore I will deliver him. I will set him on high because he's, called, uh, he's known my name. He shall call upon me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him with long life. Well, I satisfy him and show him my salvation. Now, remember the scripture says, you know, uh, three, they, they, that God will satisfy you with, you know, give you uh, three score and ten days, and by reason of strength, strength, four score years or days, 70 to 80 years. God's minimum on, on long life is 70 to 80. So if you're dying before 70 or 80, you're dying, you, and it's really not even God's best. God's best is 125 in this life on the, in the, now. But God's best is not 40. God's not best is not getting killed in a car wreck at, 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 at 38. Right. Having cancer and dying at 52. Are you here? That's not, that's not the promise of God. I walk in the inheritance. I walk in the blessing. You walk in the blessing. Yes. Amen. Amen. We're, we're predestined to have the inheritance. Glory to God. Praise Praise. Amen. 
Well, let's run back over to Galatians. We're going to finish up now. I mean, Ephesians. In whom we also obtain an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. The counsel of his own will is, with long life I'll satisfy him. I will deliver him. You know, I set my, you know I'll do, and God's going to do all these things. I'll bless him and increase him and cause all this to come on. That is the counsel of his own will. That we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ and whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and whom also after you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore, and now we're going to stop, we're going to stop here, because next this gets into the prayer. He sealed us with the Holy Ghost. Not only do we get the promise of a blessing and on the earth, there's the future promise of the glorified, resurrected body, praise God, Amen. But he's given the promises that we have days of heaven on the earth, that we walk in blessing, that we do ever put our hand to is blessed, that we get blessed and blessed and multiplied and multiplied, that, you know, all the, all the things that God has promised us walk in this life we get. Now remember, Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 is doctrinal and establishment of who we are and what we have in Christ. Now when we get over to chapters 4, 5, and 6, it's going to be what you're supposed to do. Now, don't cut us off when we get to Ephesians 4, 5, and 6. Because if you don't do Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, you don't get to receive Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, PO Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.